and encompassing the beliefs that have been orchestrated this morning, I, I think we come to the conclusion uh, that people need Jesus. People need to be cleansed through the blood of Jesus. We go through moments where we question what we believe. We question in God's Word. We question Jesus sometimes. We question heaven and we question hell. The majority of the time that we go through those, if we have those experiences, are often in those difficult moments of life. Where something tragic maybe happens to us, or maybe something tragic may happen to somebody else. I'm referring to that this morning as the meantime. I've, I've just entitled this morning's message Living in the Meantime. Uh, the conclusion to our series will be next Sunday morning or uh, next Sunday's morning will be entitled Living After the Meantime. But uh, there may be many this morning that are actually striving, attempting to, to live in the meantime. How, how do we live in the meantime? I've come to the realization that a significant portion of our life is spent living in what I would classify as the meantime. The, the meantime of plans and fulfillment, of dreams and reality, of uncertainty and assurance, of planting and harvesting. Sometimes the meantime is the time following surgery, following divorce, following emotional breakdown, following the loss of somebody that we love. How, how do we live in the meantime? When our picture perfect world isn't quite as beautiful anymore. When things haven't worked out the way that I thought that they're supposed to work out. Yes, Anybody identify with what I'm referring to? Anybody had those moments? Yes, sir. Yeah, because we often live there. The tragedy of a breakup, the tragedy of losing somebody special to our lives, the, the tragedy of a loss of a job, of, of, of the struggles within relationships, when, when our dreams don't work out the way that we had slept them through at some point in our lives, when, when those visions don't look the way that we thought that they were supposed to look. I've just learned it's in that meantime where we just begin to wonder, is Jesus really there? Is God really there? Is this thing that we call hell and hell, is, it, is that a reality or is that just some myth that's made up in some writing that maybe I read or maybe I, I don't read? How do I, how do I live when the meantime invades my life. Uh, last week I identified with, if tonight was my last night, what would I do? And I identified seven things within Scripture that if, if this was my last day, I, I want to give you just a continuation of thoughts that I've learned through life, through, through God's Word of, of how do I live in the meantime, look here in 2 Kings, the 24th chapter with me this morning. Pick up with me in the middle of the story. Let's just start in the 10th verse. It reads, at that time, the officers of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, advanced on Jerusalem, catch this, and laid siege to it. And Nebuchadnezzar himself came up to the city while his officers were besieging it. Jehoiakim, king of Judah, his mother, his attendants, his nobles, and his officials all surrendered to him. In the eighth year of the reign of king of Babylon, he took Jehoiakim prisoner. As the Lord had declared, Nebuchadnezzar removed all the treasures from the temple of the Lord and from the royal palace and took away all the gold articles that Solomon, king of Israel, had made for the temple of the Lord. Verse 14, he carried into exile all Jerusalem, all the officers and fighting men, and all the craftsmen and artisans, a, a total of 10,000. 
Only the poorest people of the land were left. Verse 15, Nebuchadnezzar took Jehoiakim captive to Babylon. He also took from Jerusalem to Babylon the king's mother, his wives, his officials, and leading men of the land. The king of Babylon also deported to Babylon the entire force of 7,000 fighting men, strong and fit for war, and 1,000 craftsmen and artisans. Verse 17, he made Madaniah, Jehoiakim's uncle, king in his place and changed his name to Zedekiah. Boy, that couldn't have been fun. Your reign is devastated. Your land is devastated. This is leading up to the point of what we would classify as the fall of Jerusalem and then the period of the exile. God, I just thought things would work out differently than this. God, I had greater aspirations for the kingdom. Lord, I thought your word was this. I thought your word says this. Lord, why is, that's the big question, Lord, why? Why is this happening, Lord? What in the world is, is going on? You, you ever notice that the meantime is never our fault, it's somebody else's fault? And if we can't find this somebody else, then it's got to be God's fault. That's why we question God. <coughs> the meantime. Lord, why does my spouse have cancer. God, we, we've prayed for them over and over. Lord, your, your word talks about healing. Your word professes healing. Lord, your, your word declares healing. Lord, why, why do my parents have to go through this struggle? Worse yet, they, they pass and then we, we begin to question God and we simply will say things like this. God, you let us down. God, you failed us. God, you disappointed us. Imagine the king here and, and he's taken into captive his whole family, those that are close around him. Uh, the vast majority of the city, the nation is taken into captive, led to the place of exile. God, what in the world? God, God, why have you forsaken us? Let's be honest this morning, church. Those are difficult moments to live in. We cry. It hurts. Many of the worst pains of our lives are experienced there in the, the meantime. But God's Word has hope for us. He understands. God's Word has direction for us as we strive to live in what we identify as the meantime. Look over to the book of Jeremiah, the 29th chapter. Here's a letter to those who are in exile. Pick up with me in the first verse. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent to Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests. The prophet and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jehoiakim and the queen mother and the court officials and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, the artisans had gone into exile from Jerusalem. Verse 3, he entrusted to the letter to Elias, the son of Shaphan, to Jemarah, excuse me, Jemira, son of Hilkiah, whom, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. It says this, verse 4, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Catch verse 5. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Read that one more time. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. 
Lord, do you know how difficult it is here? God, do you know what we're feeling, what we're going through? Lord, do you understand the experiences of our life? The first thing that I've come to the realization of through God's Word, number one, you have to do the next thing. Whatever the next thing is for you, that's what you need to do. When in exile, God's people were admonished to do that next thing, represented by building planting gardens and, and eating the fruits of them. Whatever it is that you would have done before the meantime, simply God says, do it. If it's returning to work, go to work. If it's cutting the grass, cut the grass. If it's writing a letter, write the letter. Even if you don't feel like doing it, the important thing is simply to do the next thing that you were planning to do. Following the death of his wife, interesting statement, C.S. Lewis said this, I never realized that grief has within it such laziness. You know what happens in the meantime? A lot of people just become lazy. They sulk, they cry, they mourn it. That's part of life, I understand. But it's it's so heavy in people's lives. Some just lay in bed and don't want to get out. Some don't even want to leave their home because the meantime is is so heavy to them. During their captivity in Babylon, this is what Israel was experiencing. Their hearts, catch this, I'm not going to read all, but their hearts were hung on trees. There was no music. There, there was no song to lift their spirits. Simply put, this is why Jeremiah instructed them to build houses, to settle down, to, to plant gardens, to eat what they, were, what they produced. They were to do the next thing. They needed to realize that life must continue to move forward. That life must continue to go on. As painful as that. I, I'm not denying the pain this morning, church. I'm not denying the discomfort. I, I'm not denying the emotional struggles of our life. But we just can't sit and do nothing. I've got to get up. As difficult as it is, we've heard this. I've got to put one foot in front of the next foot, in front of the next foot, and just determine that I'm going to continue to do the next thing. If that means going to work, I'm going to go to work. If that means cutting the grass, then I cut the grass. Who knows what the next thing is? I just got to do it. Idleness. Idleness. Is a terrible place to allow the enemy to invade. <coughs> Laziness. The production of idleness. It's amazing how the enemy just begins to work within our minds. The troubles begin to blow up. The pain begins to blow up within our lives. Henry, they... They were probably the thousands just sitting around talking simply say, this is not right. Surely this isn't what was intended for us. Surely this couldn't have been the plan for us. Surely God, if, if there is a God, He had to have something greater than this in store for us. Lord, why? Why? We, we've got to do the next thing. Continue with me into the next verse. Verse 6. Jeremiah 29, 6, it declares, Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number, but do not decrease. What, what is the letter? What is the word to the exiles? First he says, do the next thing. Do something. Number two, I believe what he, he's declared is, is find something to celebrate. Find something to, to celebrate within your lives. 
He identifies weddings and births. Why? Because simply put, these are occasions. These are moments of celebration. These are moments that produce joy into somebody else's life. Oh, there may be difficult moments in that, but all of that wipes away when the mother holds that little child in her hands. That moment of celebration, that, that moment of joy. I mean, I, I've been a part of many weddings. There, there's a lot of nerves. There's a lot of anxiety. There, there are struggles. But when they see them say, I do, and they begin to cut the cake and the music begins to play, there becomes this moment of celebration and joy in people's lives. He's saying, find something. Find something to celebrate. It's not always easy, but I've learned during the meantime, there's always something to celebrate. I remember reading a story of a minister who was recovering from spinal surgery and his wife had been suffering, battling ALS. And he made this interesting statement in this article I came across. He says, there was one thing that I celebrated each morning. I celebrated having less pain today than I did the day before. The pain was still there, but what he identified was there's less today than there was yesterday. There's always something to be celebrated within the meantime. In the midst of this article, there was a little letter written to the minister. Catch this. It states, please accept my deepest sympathy. <coughs> on the passing of your beautiful wife and friends. No person or experience will ever, ever replace your happy days together. She continues, living in the same neighborhood as you, I have frequently walked down your street. At times, your lights were on and your warm home, warm home was visible as my dog and I walked by. Your true love for your wife was very visible as you cheerfully cared for her needs in the kitchen area. Many times I had tears just seeing you two together and so in love with each other. It continues that that is true love. How lucky you were to have each other and with such dedication. It concludes you will be blessed for caring for her in such a dear and compassionate way. But let me say thank you for blessing me on my neighborhood walks. Even in the meantime, we can celebrate caring for each other. Caring for each other. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying that there's not pain, but there's always always something to be celebrated in the meantime the lord says find it find what can be celebrated continue with me in the scripture skip down i'm skipping the scripture that most people want to read we'll get back to it but skip down to verse 12 then you will call upon me and come to pray to me and i will listen to you you will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole hearts. Can I give you number three? Don't forget to pray. Pray. In the meantime, I realize that difficult times are not always easy times in which to pray. But can I encourage you to pray? Pray. Never cease praying and, and seeking the face of the Lord's. It's easy in those moments where maybe we question our belief, when we question our, our, our visions, our dreams, that we feel like we're inspired. It's easy in those moments to, to stop praying, to stop calling upon the name of the Lord, to stop seeking God. But if I can, the best thing I can give you this morning is, is just seek the face of God. Spend moments in prayer. Moments in, in meditation. Back to the article that I had referenced. Elizabeth, the wife of the minister, as she was suffering with that Lou Gehrig disease for 10 years, it says, I understand that the average length of suffering is three years. She, she continued for 10 years. 
The minister says, by the grace of God, we were given 10 years. He says, but our prayer time together was every evening. He recalls one distinct moment in early November when his wife Elizabeth said, I, I prayed him that God will let me live through Thanksgiving when one last time I will be with my children and my, my grandchildren. She goes, then I want to go home because I'm not angry, I'm just tired. And I want to go home. But then she stated to her husband, but I don't think that you're praying that way. <laughs> he replied, Honey, I'm not praying contrary to your prayers. But if I were, your prayers would surely prevail over mine because I believe you're a better Christian than I am. Nevertheless, it states nothing would bring her a moment of peace except to hear the, the crux of this prayer. Lord, I, I thank you for giving us 49 years together. Out of gratitude for these wonderful years, I'm willing to give her back to you. But I just want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for the time that we've had together. The story would go on to say that Elizabeth's prayer was granted. She, she relished that Thanksgiving with her children, with her grandchildren. Having lost all of her arms, the only way that she could embrace them was for her husband to pull them up, to pull up her lip arms around her grandchildren so that she could hug them. God heard her prayers and called her home on Sunday morning, December the 1st. Can I tell you, it's not easy to pray in the meantime, but you have to pray. We have to continue to Keep on seeking the face of the Lord. Sometimes we need others to come around us and to help us pray. In the meantime, don't forsake your brothers and your sisters in the Lord. In the meantime, stay with them. Encourage them with moments of, of prayer together. So as we go through this, let me identify one more time. We, first, we must learn to do the next thing. Number two, we have to learn to find something to celebrate. Number three, we have to forget not to pray. And lastly, number four for you this morning. Don't worry about turning there. Let me just read it. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 7 says, because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore have I set my face like flints, and I know that I will not be put to shame. What is number four? I have to learn to walk on through it. I, I have often made reference to a quote that I saw one time hanging on a wall. I, I love the quote because I think it identifies to this point. This, just paraphrasing, you've heard it. Life is not waiting for the rain to pass by when it's learning to dance in the rain. Sometimes we just we go in hiding and wait for it to pass by. Sometimes we just have to learn to walk through it. It's amazing what takes place if we can just learn to to walk through it. Isaiah was moving on. He was choosing to move forward. He realized that the day would come when the exile would end and hearts would yet again sink. He knew that the time would come when sadness would turn to joy. Tears would turn to laughter. When it seemed he had come to the end of the hope, he tied a knot and he chose to hang on. To hang on. Sometimes we got to hang on and just be willing just to walk through it. To walk through it. Why? Because in the meantime, I want you to know that God is yet still working in your life. God hasn't forsaken you. God hasn't given up on you. He says, so set your face like flint and walk on through it. Walk on through it. 
I can tell you some of the most painful moments of my life were there in the meantime. I didn't know what I was going to do. All I could do was what I knew I knew I was supposed to do. Let me just be transparent with you for a moment. When you're living in the meantime, a lot of times you just feel numb. Spiritually numb. Emotionally you feel it. It hurts. But I'm just being honest. Spiritually you feel numb. Hear me. In the meantime, I read the scripture. But I'm not convinced I'm getting anything from what I'm reading. I'm just reading it because I know that's what I'm supposed to do. There's times that I'm praying. And I'll be honest, transparent. I, I wonder, God, are, are you even hearing these prayers? God, God, do you even recognize that I'm seeking you? I don't feel anything. I don't feel that stirring, that charge. But you know what I do? I keep doing it. Even though I may be feeling spiritually numb. I may feel like, what's the use to go to work? But I go because God tells me to go to work. I get up and walk. And there are times that I don't feel like I feel my feet. But I just walk. I find those little moments of celebration. And I hate to share what some of those moments are because they may sound silly. But sometimes they're small. But without a moment of celebration. And saying, Lord, I just want to say thank you. Sometimes I wonder what's the use. It's the meantime. It's learning to live in the meantime. And I've had those moments in my life. And the amazing thing is when I realize that I've, I've made my way, I've, I've walked through that meantime, I, it's amazing how when I look back, I'm like, Lord, you are unbelievable. God, you are who you profess that you are. God, even though I wasn't feeling it, God, even though I, I wasn't seeing it, I, I now realize that I've, I've come through it and I can look back and say, God, you are amazing. God, there's none like you. And I begin to go through some self-examinations and here's the amazing thing. I begin my, my expectation, my, my belief of God grows, but I also realize that, that spiritually, though I was feeling nothing, there are some of the greatest moments of growth within my life. Because I just kept on keeping on. I learned how to dance in the rain. I learned how to live in the storm. I'm going to be honest with you, Sandy. Anybody can live when the water's calm. This is going to sound crazy, but this is just my crazy mind. I remember being in the water one time. I grew up water skiing. I'm not really good at it anymore. I just got old and whatever. But, you know, I, I'd get up. This, this sounds crazy. I'd get up at 6.30 in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning. Because you know what the water looks like at 6 o'clock, 6.30 in the morning? Like glass. Oh, that's a dreamer's, uh, the skier's dream. To go out and just lay the ski over sideways and just cut and not have to worry about any ripples. Smooth. Hardly any friction. I mean, it's the old phrase like cutting through soft butter. That's what it was. And, 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 and you know me, when, when things aren't going good, I just sometimes would go out and pull weeds to remind myself what I could be doing throughout eternity. Because that's what people do in hell, because I believe in hell. That's what they do all day long as they pull weeds. <laughs> just trying to help you out. <clears throat> pull weeds and they paint trim. I can do them both, but it's miserable. So I just have to remind myself, Jerry, you can do this throughout all eternity, or you just 
pick yourself up and get going again. You know, I don't know what it is for you, but that's you may love that. If you do, I had already some home volunteering for a week pulling this morning. I'll give you addresses. If, if you water ski, you, you hate the rough water. It's just, it's work. It's it's unnecessary work. If, if I had just got up at 6 or 6.15, I, I wouldn't have to mess with this stuff. So every now and then, when the water was just miserable, I would just take the boat out with just usually my dad. White cap. Everybody know what that is? Throw on a ski and go out and just ski. Because anybody can ski when it's smooth. Well, most anybody can. I found a couple that can. I won't say names this morning. But most... But not everybody wants to live and do it when it's difficult and rough. But that's when you grow. And Shasta, it's the same way in life. When it's smooth, hey, anybody can do that. But what am I going to do now? Surely when things don't go the way I think that they need to go, am I still going to live and keep walking? I love what the Apostle Paul says. I press on. I press on. Can you hear his voice this morning, church? I'm a battle on. Because I know who's called me. I know who's saved me. I, I know who's redeemed my life. I was reading this morning about when he was being shipwrecked. When he was in prison arrest. But yet, the Apostle Paul would look out and, and the water's not like glass. It's, it's white cap. He's wondering if he's going to live. The sailors are wondering. They're, they're fixing to jump ship on them. Leave these, leave these boys to their own. But the Apostle Paul says, Yet I'm going to press on. I'm going to continue to put one foot in front of the next foot. I'm going to continue to worship. To love my Jesus. And tell others about my Jesus. Even in the meantime. Even when not everything's beautiful the way that I thought that it was supposed to be. I mean, I'm going I'm to love my husband even in the meantime. I'm going to love my wife even in the meantime. I'm going to profess the greatness of God even in the, the meantime. I'm going to tell people about Jesus. Even though if they looked at my life, they would wonder if there's even a God. But what a testimony for me in the midst of the storm to declare, yet I know who my Redeemer is. Yet I, I know who my God is. I, I know who my Savior is. Even in the meantime. Yes, sir. You see, we have a choice. We have a choice. Are we going to do the next thing? Are we going to find those moments of celebration? Are we going to pray and, and, and commit myself to devotion in, in God's Word? Am I, am I going to choose to continue to walk? Or am I just going to quit? Am I going to quit? You know, I don't believe God's called us to quit. I don't believe God has called us to, to give up. I believe God's called us to continue to, to press on. To press on. To press on. Why? Because the sun will come back out again. The water will calm back down again. The fire will go out. It's just part of life. It's part of life. I'll conclude with this. Jesus says, hey, take hearts. I'm just paraphrasing. Don't be afraid. For in this world, you will have troubles. You, you will have meantime.
But I've overcome. And you will overcome. I've overcome. And you will overcome. Because I live, you also will live. Jesus had the meantime, but yet he rose three days later. I believe that we'll rise to meet him as long as we hang on to him and continue to declare his greatness. Amen.